Thank you, Daphne, for the introduction, and uh, hello, everybody. I remember my first time at um, Canberra, eight years ago, moving down to take the job at Page, and I put my foot in it immediately. Um, I think I called people bureaucrats. Um, <laughs> and public servants very quickly corrected, you know, no, public servants, please. Um, <laughs> Likewise, I was tempted to get up and say, hey, tuggers, um, but I, 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 I don't know, is that offensive to Tugrenonians, or I, I'm not sure. What do you call yourselves? Um, are they tuggers? Yeah, that's all right. Okay, well, um, hello, everybody. It's nice to be here today. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I understand you've been going through resurrection um, with uh, the preachers from Page, and I thought I would continue that on today. Um, the resurrection of Jesus. Great topic. Uh, and I think you've been focusing on 1 Corinthians 15, uh, a great passage on the resurrection. I want to read uh, verses 13 to 19 for you from that just again. Uh, it should be up on the screen. So we're reading 1 Corinthians 12, 15, 13 to 19. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the dead. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. It's really important when uh, someone repeats themselves, isn't it? Uh, I seem to be going in circles here, but we get to the point. Uh, and if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world." Seems the resurrection is pretty important, isn't it? Uh, pretty important. Uh, in fact, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ has not taken place, then we are to be pitied. Um, we are wasting our time. Our faith is useless. What are you doing here? Like, go. Uh, it seems to all hinge on the resurrection, which then makes it the one target, doesn't it? If you want to tear Christianity down, it's the one thing that you will target. It's the one thing you will try to destroy. And there have been many, many attempts. For centuries now, people have been investigating the resurrection, looking at the evidence for the resurrection, trying to, to work out whether this is just some fanciful claim uh, of a group of nut jobs, or if it is historical fact. There's lots of different arguments. I'm not going to go into the, the arguments in a huge detail, but, but, but people will claim, well, sure, Jesus probably was put on a cross, but he never died, and that sort of explains why they got to see him afterwards, the, so the whole swoon theory that he just faked his death. Um, there are those who will say, well, the body was stolen, um, and so that's why the tomb was empty. There are those who will, will say, it's just a myth, that um, it, it's this story that developed over time. So at the beginning, the, the disciples, the church didn't really claim that, that he was resurrected, but just it, it, the story they started telling themselves. Why? Because a legend like that can help us make, our feels, uh, make ourselves feel a little better about ourselves and about the lives we live and about the world around us. Um, or my favourite one, that they were hallucinating, um, that they were just having a hallucination, despite the fact that that's not how hallucinations work. I myself don't believe I've ever had an hallucination. How would I know? Um, I've, if I see it, I, I think it's real. Uh, those who hallucinate often do. But you can't get 500 people together in a room, put something in the air vents, I don't know, that makes them hallucinate, and they all hallucinate <coughs> the same thing. Hallucinations just do not work like that. Uh, and so there's been all sorts of attempts to explain away uh, the resurrection. Uh, because again, if you can do that, if you can weaken the, the evidence, weaken 
your, your faith and your resolution that the resurrection took place, then everything else in Christianity falls apart. So can you make an argument for the resurrection? Absolutely. We do it all the time. I presume you're here because you believe Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And if he can be raised from the dead, then I can too. That's our Christian hope. Uh, But what does history show us? With all these people arguing about the evidence, is, is is there kind of a baseline of evidence that everyone agrees to? If we were to take everything we know about history, all the the archaeological evidence, the the textual evidence, if we were to take all of that and you had Christians and non-Christians alike, in fact, not just non-Christians, if you had those who who hate Christianity, if you had the most ardent atheists arguing against it and looking at the evidence, could we boil it down to a, a set number of minimal facts? Minimal facts that everyone can agree to. What would that look like? And if we were able to discern what everybody agrees to, what story would that tell? Well, a guy called Gary Habermas, anyone heard of him? Anyone heard the minimal facts argument? Yeah, that's good. Uh, <laughs> I'll be boring you then. A uh, guy called Gary Habermas is a guy who was doing a PhD, and this is the, the task he undertook. He, he undertook to gather everything that's ever been written about the resurrection. Now, with a caveat. He wasn't going and looking at Joe Blog's blog online. Like, he's not looking at some random person who's typing away on the internet giving his opinion. He's looking at credentialed opinions. Anyone who has qualifications in the area of of archaeology, history, textual criticism, um, New Testament, Old Testament uh, study, uh, anyone who actually has poured some effort into skilling themselves up to be able to comment on it. Uh, Looking at Christian sources, obviously a lot of those, but looking at non-Christian sources uh, and looking at at gathering the evidence, everything they have to say about it. He spent years cataloguing this. He's got this whole long, great big spreadsheet of sources. And on it he was able to to go, okay, what what do people agree? And he wanted to, to... to raise the bar, he went, right, I'm going to set a really high bar uh, and I'm going to say, right, I'm only going to accept evidence that, that the vast majority, over 95% of people agree to. So if 90% of all those who comment on this agree that this happened, then that, that will make the mark. But I'm going to raise the bar even higher. Um, So I think on my next slide I've got the two things. So the essentials. So there will be multiple independent sources. That means that for for me to even consider it, it it can't just come from the Bible. Um, It can't just come from one of the Testaments or one of the, the Gospels. But there has to be multiple sources commenting on it. Uh, That makes sense, doesn't it? That makes sense. So we want multiple people commenting on it. And the majority of scholars have to agree over 90%. In the vast majority of cases, it's up around 99%. And so that's the bar he set for himself. He said, right, if we set that bar, what does everybody then agree upon? Uh, And there's some historical... uh, There's reasons why these scholars would believe it. when you study history, there's some rules, some ground rules. Uh, if you don't follow these ground rules, then you can't claim to know anything about history, really. So if we're going to study history and, uh, and believe these historical claims, then there's some common facts we have to agree to. Um, one, that a claim, historical claim that is made by somebody that, that actually is the enemy of those it benefits. So if I I write something down, I don't like it, it doesn't help my case, but I'm going to write it down. That's strong evidence. So when your enemies are writing something that you believe, that's really strong evidence. Uh, It's not just the true faithful ones who are are writing it. Uh, Claims that embrace embarrassing details. So if you want to, to write something and, you know, 
it's, wow, if, if they were making this up, you wouldn't write that. It's, it's quite embarrassing, really. Um, so we don't want to embarrass people. So when we find stories, history accounts of things that kind of embarrass those who are included in it, we go, okay, that, that's a little more believable than one that says, oh, Peter boldly proclaimed that uh, Jesus is the Lord and he never denied. And weren't you with Jesus? Absolutely I was. You know, not embarrassing, but when he's denying Jesus, we, we go, okay, there's a little bit of, um, maybe that we, we can trust that. Historical claims are strongest when they're supported by eyewitness testimony. Makes sense, doesn't it? So obviously, if eyewitnesses are the ones telling us the story, we go, that's better than third-hand information. And lastly, that historical claims are more reliable the closer they're made to the event. So the closer they are to the event, that we go, yeah, someone a hundred years down the track commenting about it we go well pff, whatever but someone the day after talking about it we go oh well we're going to trust them more than the person 100 years down the track makes sense doesn't it these are this is how historical study takes place these are ground rules not just for biblical study but for all of history um, and you might be surprised to find that um, the evidence for a lot of our historical figures um, are pretty weak. So who's heard of Alexander the Great? I'm sure we all have, most of us. If you're younger, you may not have yet. Uh, but Alexander the Great, um, we do not doubt he lived. We do not doubt uh, the journeys that he took and the, the, the battles that he fought and the great accomplishments that he achieved. Um, but the closest document we have recorded not just a copy of something that was written really close to him, but, but someone writing about him. The closest we have was written about 300 years after he lived. 300 years. There's nothing we have recorded of him in that period of time. Uh, and yet none of us doubt it whatsoever. So when we're talking history, like 300 years can be, that, that's decent evidence. We're, we're going to buy into that. So let's look at what Gary found as he looked at these minimal facts. So I'm going to talk about um, five minimal facts today. Five things. There, there's more. Um, and, as an example, um, Gary, in his list of minimal facts, actually doesn't include the empty tomb. You might be thinking, oh, the empty tomb, that's got to be one of the, the minimal facts that everyone agrees to. He doesn't use it because it doesn't match the criteria. Um, it doesn't meet that 90% criteria for him because there's lots of people who will deny that it was empty. So... Minimal fact number one, Jesus died to crucifixion. You might think, well, duh, like, really? Uh, yeah, but think about it. That has come into question. Jesus died due to crucifixion. So not swoon theory, not that he, he sort of half died, um, but that he died. And it wasn't, as some would claim, on a stake or a pole or by other some means, but it was by crucifixion. This is just universally accepted. There is no discussion, there's no debate about this in people who've actually studied and looked at this. He died by crucifixion and even the greatest enemies of Christianity will accept this. They'll, they'll, they'll give it to us. Okay, yeah, Jesus, he, he was died by crucifixion. If we know anything about the Romans and how they executed people, anything about crucifixion, we know that he definitely died on a cross. That's minimal fact number one. And Gary said there's at least 15 different sources within the first 100 years uh, following his crucifixion within the Bible and outside the Bible that will speak about his death and resurrection. It's a very reliable fact and uh, it's really not disputed. Um, in fact, we don't find any other documents from that period of time that say anything other than that. It, it just is the case. So Jesus died due to crucifixion. Number two, Jesus' followers very soon after believed that they saw the resurrected Jesus. Now, this isn't saying that they did see the resurrected Jesus. What it's saying is there is no doubt whatsoever that the believers, the followers of Jesus, believed it. They believed they saw the real Jesus. They, they didn't claim to see a ghost. They didn't claim to see um, a, a body double, 
uh, uh, you know, there's these people who argue, oh, Jesus must have had a secret twin. Um, or the, and this is where the swoon theory came. He didn't really die, but, you know, he pierced and beaten and bloodied and holes in his hands. You know, he would have been a, a walking mess. But no, no, they see this lively, sprightly, resurrected Jesus. That's what they claim. That's what they believe that they saw. There's no doubt in their minds, at least, that that's what they saw. And this happens numerous times in the Gospels. We, we find account after account. There's Mary at the tomb, then the three women at the tomb, the two disciples on the road to Emmaus following the, the week. Uh, they're wandering along, and as they're walking, someone comes alongside and goes, what are you talking about? Oh, what, are you, have you had your head buried in the sand? Like, have you not known what's going on this weekend? Like, this, this Jesus fellow that we thought was the Messiah, was, was, we'd pinned all our hopes on him, and, and yet... They killed him. Um, really, really, tell me more. Well, and they tell him everything that they were experiencing and feeling. And, and then when they get um, a little further down the road, he says, oh, really, well, let me show you, you know. And he opens the Old Testament to them. And then it's not till they stop and break bread and their eyes are open. They go, oh, my goodness, it's Jesus. Um, this is who we've been talking with this whole time where our heart's not burning within us as we saw him. Like, these aren't short little stories. This isn't... I got a glimpse. Um, I thought I saw him walking past out of the corner of my eye, you know, because they're grieving people. And no, 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 these are real interactions. Um, you've got the 10 disciples hiding in the upper room, hiding. Um, and all of a sudden he just appears amongst them. Um, the, the last thing they expected, and, and yet it happens. Uh, you've got then the 11 disciples because of Doubting Thomas wasn't there, was he? I won't believe you saw him unless I can touch and put my hand through the, the nail-pierced hands. Um, and of course, Jesus appears to him, uh, affirms it. You've got the seven disciples, including Peter on the beach when they're out fishing. They actually come and eat with Jesus. He's cooking fish for them and they, they, they eat breakfast with him. Like this is a flesh and blood body. They believe they have encountered and interacted with him. And of course... You've got um, the meeting of 500, where 500 people are gathered all at one time and they, they meet. And the Bible tells us, you know, some of those people who were there, you, you can go and speak to some of them. They'll tell you what they saw. So Jesus' followers believed it. There's no doubt about that. Jesus died on a cross and his believers absolutely believed they saw him. Number three. Jesus' followers proclaimed the event of the resurrection right away. So this is really important. This isn't a story that developed over time. It's not um, something they added on that they, as they were trying to scratch their heads and make sense of what was taking place. Almost immediately, well, I would say immediately, we find that the, the church, the early church, is claiming the resurrection of Jesus. Their story doesn't change. It, it seems consistent from the very beginning. Now, we see this in a number of ways. When we study the New Testament, and particularly the Gospels and Acts, um, we see this thing in, uh, called the, the homologia, um, the common sayings. Uh, so when you dissect and pull apart every sermon given in Acts, every um, statement made in the Gospels, how they structured the major themes... There are these common themes, these common sayings littered throughout them. And every single time you'll find these three elements. You'll find the divinity of Jesus, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection of Jesus. Whenever the Gospels proclaim, these three things are always mentioned. They're never not mentioned. It's not, not that they ever talk about the divinity and how he was divine and, and yet died and then they stop there. It never ends there. It always includes the resurrection. Always. Um, there will be some who will argue the Gospel of John. So when we look at the Gospels, they're all sort of written. Or we, we tend to think Mark was written first, then sort of Matthew, Luke, uh, and then John's the last one to be written. So there's those who will argue, well, in John's Gospel, we see a more developed sense of Jesus. So John really clearly talks about God being divine. Uh, and there's, there has this high view of Christ, um, much more developed than the others. Mark seems to be pretty simple in some understanding. And so some will argue 
well, here we go. You can see the development. The early church didn't start with this high view of Christ, but it sort of grows and the, the myth and the legend develops over time. And yet it's pretty easy to point to any of the Gospels and find this theme, the divinity, the death and the resurrection of Jesus are there every time. When they preach, that's what they preached. But there's more than that. There's also the creedal statements. So a creedal statement is just a, a statement of, of theological belief. Um, it's a declaration of uh, this we hold to be true. Uh, and the New Testament is littered with them. Uh, these statements that, that were common statements, these things that the church would have repeated and it would have been said, much like the Lord's Prayer uh, happens in churches today or the Apostles' Creed, some churches will, will state this uh, as just common things that were said. There, there's dozens of them littered throughout the epistles. Um, Romans 10.9 is a good example of one. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So uh, Paul here probably was, was quoting something that was commonly said. Uh, this is what Christians believed and uh, as a community they, they embraced this truth. Um, 1 Corinthians, the chapter we're looking at, has one of these creedal statements. Uh, verse 3 to 7. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. That's it. It's sort of this creedal language, isn't it? Like, this is something that was taught to me and now I'm teaching it to you. Um, Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead. And on the third day, just as the scriptures said, he was seen by Peter and then by the twelve after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. That's where the, the sort of creedal statement ends. Uh, Paul goes on to add, oh, and by the way, he also appeared to, to James, his brother, and to, lastly to, to me as well. Uh, and so he sort of continues that, that story on with his own testimony. He adds it to us. We could add our own, couldn't we? And... and you know, and me too, uh, as well. But there's these creedal statements, and again, these are very early statements. They're not late developments. They're not a hundred years later, as some will argue, that all of a sudden they started believing Jesus was resurrected. No, no, no. Very early. How do we know that? Well, let's say Jesus was crucified and risen from the grave 30 AD. Okay, we'll just use that as a marker. It's some debate whether it's a year or two after that, but um, that's all right. 30 AD, most commonly accepted date that he died. Now, if we take that as our marker, Paul, when does he have his conversion experience? So Paul's this guy who's persecuting the church, as Saul, his, as his name was to begin with, um, He's out there, he's holding the coats for the first martyr when they're stoning Stephen. He's collecting all their coats, looking on. He's got letters giving him authority to go and arrest Christians. Like he's, he's a great enemy and persecutor of the church. But he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus and his eyes are open. Jesus speaks to him, he's blinded. Uh, and then a Christian prays for him, opens his eyes, gives his life to Jesus. So there's this miraculous transformation. But when does that take place? How long do you reckon after the death and resurrection of Jesus? So it, it would be the best guess about two years later. About two years. Some will say, oh yeah, that's a bit early, maybe three. So three at the most. Um, so you've got a three year gap. Um, so three years. Uh, Galatians 1 tells us really interesting facts about Paul's testimony in his journey. So in Galatians chapter 1, um, he gives us a bit of a timeline of what happens. And, and Paul says, you know, after I, I first encountered Jesus and met Jesus, he appeared to me, I then went off um, and, and found some time uh, in Arabia. For three years, he went on this sort of journey. Now, if you know anything about Paul, Paul's a smart guy. Like, Paul was, you know, the Pharisee of all Pharisees. He was the bright gun. He was the straight-A student. He was the ducks of, you know, um, 
temple. Uh, whatever, the, 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 the school to become the Pharisee. He was the next big thing. Like, he was smart. He goes off for three years to try and get his theology in check. He's trying, going to get his um, thoughts in alignment. Studying the Old Testament scriptures, uh, we can only presume. Um, looking for Jesus in it. Just getting his head straight. So for three years he has this bit of a gap. So if there's two years, three we'll say, maximum. Uh, another three is six years. After six years he tells us that he returns to Jerusalem where he meets Peter. And it's there in Jerusalem as he's talking with Peter that, that he wants to, to check in, to just make sure that um, he is all right with them. And this is before he goes off on his missionary journeys to all the Gentile cities. So he goes and meets Peter and spends a number of weeks with him, days, weeks, where he's just going over the stories and listening and Peter's sharing and telling him all of his experience. And you know, he would have learned an awful lot at that point in time. He goes off for 14 years, does his numerous missionary journeys all around Asia Minor and um, to the Gentile cities. And after 14 years in Galatians 2, he tells us he goes back to Jerusalem. He returns to Jerusalem. And it tells us there that he went back in order to check, just to confirm that what he has been preaching is still what they're preaching in Jerusalem, to make sure that, that his story, his gospel that he's sharing is exactly the same as theirs. And what does he say? He says, and to my you know, relief, um, absolutely, nothing changed. We're, we're sharing the same story. Now, when was he given that story? When did he first encounter it? When was that first time? Now, about six years after Jesus' resurrection when he first came back after his time away in Arabia to, to meet with Peter. It's there that he, he swapped stories and, and he would have been given those, those testimonies and statements about the, the divinity, death and resurrection of Jesus. He goes, preaches at 40, he comes out and goes, yeah, is this still all right? Yep, it is. Yep, great. Keep going on your way. And so uh, as far as time goes, obviously if Peter was taught it, six years after the resurrection, that they'd been using it and saying it before then. In fact, uh, Bart Ehrman, if you've heard of him, is um, a, a great biblical scholar, uh, but he's very critical of, of Christianity and of the, the resurrection. Uh, he would argue, and, and he's very vocal about this, um, that it's very hard to deny that the early church, from the very beginning was proclaiming the, the death and resurrection of Jesus from the very beginning. There's, there's just no doubt about it. So that's number three, that um, they were proclaiming the resurrection straight away. It's not a later invention. Number four, Jesus' followers' lives were completely transformed. So there is no doubt, no question, that those who followed Jesus, <coughs> their lives were turned around. Uh, that the uh, apostles, normal fishermen, tax collectors, people who had jobs and careers, they were in their lane. This was their life. It was set out for them. They don't, they're not like us today who can change careers mid, mid-life. Um, and, you know, this, I've got multiple options before me. No, no, no. You know, you stay in your lane. My dad was a fisherman. I'm a fisherman. My sons will be fishermen. Like that, that, that was it. Um, occasionally, you know, there might be change. You might swap with your, your mate or your brother who's doing something else or I don't know. But I mean you're staying alone. But here were guys whose lives were completely turned around. Completely turned around. Uneducated men, as they're described by, by some of the educated elite in their day. You know, who are these men, you know, that speak with such wow, sorry, they they're uneducated. Like I didn't see them at Pharisee school, um, but, but here they are, um, speaking boldly and they seem to be making sense. This is amazing. Um, not only did they seem their message changed and their careers changed and their lives changed, but, but they were willing to suffer. They were willing to, to experience hardship, persecution, imprisonment and potential death and most often the case death for, for most of the apostles. Um, Time and time again. Acts 4, 5 is a great story about this where Peter and John go into the town. They start preaching the gospel. Uh, but they're arrested by the locals because um, they're causing mischief. They don't like them preaching. And so they, um, 
they say, you know, stop it and just, just so you get the message, we'll, we'll give you a good flogging. And so they're whipped and then they're released. Now, what do they do the next day? Now, if I've made lies, if I'm making up stories, if, I, if I'm just trying to con people, what do I do? Do, do I, I... I'm more likely to move on, aren't I? I'm just going to go on to the next town. Maybe I'm not going there for another flogging. Uh, but what do they do? They go straight back to the very spot they were preaching the day before and they continue what they're doing. Now, they do this again. They're imprisoned. They go to jail. I mean, imagine you're sitting there in jail going, what did I do, mate? Now, I really need to move towns if this is the case. But no, they, they go back. God releases them. They come out. They preach again. Um, and then they're brought before the, the council and we get these famous words from Peter in Acts 5.29 that says, we must obey God rather than any human authority when they're questioned about what they're doing. We must obey God, not human authority. They fully believed they were following God and their lives give evidence to the fact that that seems to be the case. And so there is no denial at all. Um, Skeptics... Christians alike will all agree it seems that there is something that has changed in the lives of, of the early followers of Jesus. They, their lives are, are not just changed, but they seem to be completely transformed. Completely transformed. And number five, Jesus' brother James becomes a believer. If there was only one I could pick of evidence, this would be it. I have a brother. Does anyone have a brother here? What would it take for me to convince you or for you to be convinced that they were perfect, sinless and the son of God? Like, I'm sorry, there's nothing at all could convince me that that's my brother. <laughs> like, it's, if anybody knows, it's a brother, isn't it? It's someone who, who was raised with you, um, who grew up with you, who saw everything you did behind mum and dad's back. The little bickering, the little poking, like all the little stuff that you'd look back and go, no, nah, they weren't loving, they weren't perfect. Um, if anyone's going to know, it's a brother. And, and yet James, Jesus' brother, somewhere between his death and resurrection and his appearance in the upper room, somewhere between this time, very short period of time, somewhere there, James is converted. James believes. Because prior to his death and resurrection, he thought he was mad. James thought his, his brother was mad. Um, we've got that story where Jesus is, is preaching, there's a crowd gathered, they, they can't even fit in the house that he's in because they're, they're just spilling out. And Mary, along with James uh, and the siblings, come along and they, they want to grab Jesus and go, what are you doing? Look at the, the kerfuffle you're making. Like, this is outrageous come come quickly they, they thought he'd gone a bit mad like how could he be doing what he's doing um, where was James at the crucifixion Jesus is on the cross he looks down who's there his mum and he says mum look at your son but is she is he pointing to to James no he's pointing to John he says here is your son here's your mother, you know, look after her. Like, if James was there, if James believed, James was one of the followers, surely he would have, have said, hey, brother, you know, make sure you look after mum. Uh, but he's not there. He's just not there. Uh, he's nowhere to be seen. And yet somehow he appears in the upper room. Somehow he, he believes he, he, he's there with the followers, not just grieving with those who um, are grieving, but, but as a believer. He goes on to be, uh, we believe, that the head of the, the church in Jerusalem, not Peter, uh, but James sort of heads up that council there in the very early church, uh, and he believes. As I said, that one alone, I just go, whoa, how do you con your family into believing it? Um, and yet there it is, everyone will accept it. Now this of all of them, this one Gary Habermas says, well, James, Jesus' brother, has not been the, a huge area of study and so there's not a lot written on, on James, but those who do write on it do, do believe that, yep, yeah, we'll, we'll grant you, tick, yep, yeah, he, he, he became a believer. Um, we'll give you that one. Now, I might have said five, but there's six. Um, 
within a few years, Paul claims to experience a post-resurrection experience of Jesus. So Paul becomes a believer. Now, this one's important for the very reasons, we don't need to go on about it because I've already mentioned it. For the very reasons I've said, he was Christianity's greatest enemy. He was Christ- In fact, his career path was built on the fact that he was persecuting the Christian church. He, he was getting a name for himself because he was the one going and, and arresting them all and persecuting them all and, and oversighting this. He, was, he could see, this is my golden ticket to get ahead. Boom, and he jumps on the bandwagon and he goes for it. And yet, with a man who, who hates them so much, who has so much to gain by hating them, by being so convinced in his mind that he was right, by having an entire support system and structure of the Jewish religious system, pinning all their hopes on him. Like, like, there's no way he could lose in life. Like he was the golden boy. With all that at stake, he converts to Christianity. He finally comes to accept that, no, 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 I was wrong. And I'm going to turn my back on everything that I've invested in and supported and worked so hard to, for, and, and I'm going to give my life to Jesus. That, that's incredible. Well, that, that's, that's stuff you make movies out of. Like, that's an incredible turnaround. Uh, and yet, everybody will grant you that seems to be the case. Absolutely. We can't deny Paul existed. We can't deny he was a believer and we can't deny that he wasn't before it. So um, we'll give you that one. So there we have the six minimal facts. Six minimal facts. Let me um, look at them really quickly. Jesus died due to crucifixion. His followers believed they saw Jesus. His followers proclaimed the resurrection immediately. The lives of his followers were transformed, completely transformed. Jesus' own brother James believed he was risen from the grave and Paul went from enemy to believer. Now we've got to remember, this is historical evidence we're looking at. This is historical claims. Uh, and anybody who's studied history and, and knows how to study history will grant you these facts, uh, over 90, 95% of, of those. Out there. Of course, you're going to find some who, no, no, I don't believe that. Um, but by and large, to, to deny these facts is to deny the study of history. Does that make sense, if I put it like that? Like, if, if you're going to deny these, you've got to go, well, on what grounds? Because any other thing we study throughout history, we would, we would use the same kind of evidence and the same criteria to judge it. And so if you deny these, then, then you, you've either got a bias and you're just not willing to accept it, or, or you're actually rejecting the study of all history. But Gary, as he found, Christians will, uh, and non-Christians, atheists alike, will, will grant you these. Now... Does that mean these six facts will lead you to to a belief in the resurrection of Jesus? Well, obviously not, because there's atheists who will even believe this. But they'll come up with their theories around it. But here's the question you have to answer. And remember, these aren't theories, it's evidence. With so much evidence, how can you not have a resurrection? With so much evidence, how can you not have a resurrection? Let's briefly look at the the reason. Well, Jesus swooned or faked his death. Well, we know that's just not the case. It's undeniable. He died due to crucifixion. Maybe the body was stolen out of the tomb. Um, And that's why. Well, we're not even looking at an empty tomb. It's not even part of our facts. We don't need it to to make the case for the resurrection. Uh, it was a, a myth created long time after. Well, no, it wasn't. We know it was immediately. This was the message. Immediately they started talking about, hey, Christ has risen. Uh, there's people alive. Go talk to them. They'll tell you the day they saw him. Was it a legend to make people feel better? 
Well, it doesn't seem to be, does it? Um, I don't know if you're feeling better as you're being whipped and flogged and imprisoned and outcast and attempted to be stoned to death and all the horrible things that the early believers went through. Um, it certainly didn't... It wasn't for riches and glory that they, they proclaimed it, was it? Or that they all hallucinated. Well, you don't even need these facts to deny that. I mean, there's multiple people. They're eating with him. They're, they're touching him. This isn't some ghostly apparition or vision um, that they had. My, my favourite hallucination story is of a, a debate between atheists and William Lane Craig, a, a Christian apologist. And he, they're in a debate and a conversation and this atheist starts making the argument that, well, you know, the halluc- he goes down the hallucination path. There's a reason why modern atheists don't argue for hallucinations anymore because it just doesn't work. But anyway, this guy's like, yeah, no, it's hallucinations. We know that this happens and people hallucinate and in grief you're, you're particularly susceptible to hallucinating if you've lost a loved one. It's very common for people to claim to see them um, or think they see them or to have conversations with them um, and just think they're there. So obviously the, these early believers who were grieving hallucinate. That's his explanation. So that he pin, hinges his whole argument against it and he says, so he argues against the, the, the Jesus died, rose from the grave and um, at the end William Lane Craig turns to him and says, so, so what kind of evidence would you believe? What kind of evidence do you need personally to believe in God? And he goes, well, you know, if one day I woke up and um, you know, opened my eyes and there was this, this shining light coming through my bedroom window and, and I went out to see what it was and there before me in the sky, you know, 80 feet in the sky was a giant image of like this godlike figure. Uh, and, and this figure up in the sky would boom down in this great voice, you know, um, I forget what the guy's na- name was now, um, but we'll call him Dan. Dan, I am the risen Jesus. Believe in me, you know. Maybe then, if, if, if that happened, you know, then I would believe. And uh, William Lane Craig turns and goes, you know, that's remarkable. It's, it's incredible that, that, that you would believe if that took place. But, but wouldn't it be more logical, according to your logic, that you're simply hallucinating? <laughs> and the guy's got, oh. Oh, it shut him up because, you know, it's, if anyone else sees something weird, it, they're hallucinating. If I saw it, well, you know, my logical brain would never hallucinate. Um, it's clearly not hallucination. The question we have to ask ourselves, with this much evidence, how do you explain it besides a resurrection? Now, I argue this because I believe the Christian church, the Christian faith is under attack. I believe that there are many people who, who would waver. Um, they've got work colleagues who will be talking and, and criticising the church and it, it's very easy to, to have your faith attacked and, and to wane. And yet I would want to stand here today and say we have good reason to believe what we believe. In fact, it is more logical. Uh, it's more probable that the resurrection took place given everything we know than to believe an alternate explanation. It would take more faith to believe that it was some giant conspiracy. Uh, More faith to believe that the the body was stolen. More faith to believe that it was a later invention of the church. It takes more faith to believe those things than to simply accept Jesus must have risen from the grave. Let me pray. Father God, thank you for uh, your death and resurrection. As Paul tells us, if uh, you are not raised from the dead, if the resurrection of the dead is not possible, then we have no hope of our own resurrection. We're to be pitied. And, and yet, because you died and rose from the grave, we have this great hope of a future, a great hope of eternal life where death can no longer touch us. And so we give you thanks for that, that we can come today and praise you. Uh, we can, can celebrate what you've done. And just like those early believers whose lives were transformed, our lives are transformed too by this knowledge, Father. And it would be my prayer today that you instill in us a deep confidence 
an unshakable and unwavering faith that is built upon history, uh, upon your interaction in real time in this world, not on theories, not on visions, but on real events, that our faith would be built on that solid foundation that is you. We thank you for providing us a record for it. We thank you that we can be confident that our faith is not wishful thinking. And with that confidence that we have in your death and resurrection, help us to be courageous then in sharing that, in living lives that reflect that, in not being ashamed to declare it. We ask that your Holy Spirit would bring about that change in us, that you might be glorified. Thank you, Lord. We ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.